Okay, um, I think we can start now. We are already live. So I'll just introduce. Um, hey everyone, um, I'm Kranti uh, from Satvik Soul Foundation. And uh, I'm really happy to, uh, you know, be back again after, I think, for so long. And um, today we are uh, going to talk about uh, climate change and, uh, you know, certain things related to it, how to go about it. Um, and uh, as you know that from past uh, few months, uh, Satvik Soul Foundation has been working, uh, you know, related to climate change in all aspects. And uh, we have done a very good job, all our volunteers and everyone. And uh, taking that step, step ahead, um, we are starting uh, up with the, the live shows talking to uh, climate change activists and uh, to know about their experiences and to know more uh, like how we can go about that and what's all related uh, to climate changes that we can do right as we know it's a burning topic all over the country and uh, how important it is for us to uh, as a generation and when we think about the coming generations right um, so climate uh, change makes a very it's a very big factor um, which is a, a very important topic that we should have knowledge about it's just not about going and doing something about the climate but you have to have a knowledge on what to do and what not to do right so um today i'm uh, gladly introducing uh, kuziva who is from south africa he's just uh, 18 years old and uh, he's a climate change activist and um, i was just like talking to him like five minutes back and uh, it, it feels really nice to know that it's just not about uh, going for the climate change but gaining the knowledge and then implementing it right and i think that's what i see in him and uh, uh, we would love to you know know more about like um, how he went through it and what are the things that we should go for what are the education that we can take or know more about climate change so uh, let me introduce Kuziva to all of us and uh, we are really glad uh, to have you. So uh, Kuziva, would you like to, you know, um, say a few words before we start? Okay, thank you so much, um, Kranti. This was um, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, firstly, good morning, good evening, um, wherever you are. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Kusoko Shefungai Kari. I am aged 18. I am currently a Cambridge student. Also, I'm a climate ex activist. We've been working hand in hand with different uh, non-governmental organizations in tackling um, this pressing global issue, uh, climate change. I really want to take this opportunity to appreciate um, the Scientific Soul Foundation directors and the team members for the opportunity they've given me. Um, it is my pleasure. I really thank you. And I wish that my contribution that I'll give will be very helpful to each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kushiva. So I think we will love, uh, we, uh, Kushiva has a presentation for us. I think um, he wants to uh, take us through it and uh, we can discuss in details over there and if there are any questions we'll surely you know um, ask him so i would like vikram to uh, start sharing the screen um vikram can you please start sharing the screen Kushiva, would you like to go ahead with this? You can. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to. 
Okay, um, you can go on. So like, um, firstly, uh, as we see our title of uh, our presentation is written climate change in uh, introduction and in analysis. So what we will be doing is that we'll be going through what is climate change, what is involved in climate change, and how can we um, mitigate, how can we formulate mitigation and adaptation plans to climate change. Then we'll also give a roundup by an analysis to climate change. You can go forward, Bikram. Okay, so like um, in this session, we want to cover a list of topics that I found very vital in climate change. And um, I see them as an in, uh, insight in opening people and in uh, giving people the knowledge on how to go about climate change and how to act when it comes to such a pressing global issue. We've seen that um, climate change is uh, intensifying in recent years, and it has been a topic that has been trending, be it on social media, be it wherever, in national, at regional levels, or maybe um, at global level. So delve deeper into the following topics. You can go ahead. Yeah, next slide. Okay, so these are the following topics that I found very important to note when it comes to climate change. So the first topic is uh, introduction to climate change. This will be looking at what is climate change because we've seen so many different uh, definitions that are related to climate change. Then we will look at human activities in igniting climate change. Of course, it's not only um, all about a natural thing, climate change, but we as humans, we've contributed adversely to the intensity of climate change. So other human activities will be looking at, will be delving deeper into understanding how humans have deeply contributed to uh, climate change and to climate crisis. So we'll also see, look at uh, the contribution of climate change to humanitarian emergencies. We all know like um, in the past few years, like here in Africa, we were mostly affected by um, Cyclone Idai. So uh, this is one of the humanitarian emergencies. So it is believed that this uh, image, so we'll be looking at a at, uh, contribution of climate change to humanitarian emergencies. Then we we'll look at climate change effects on regional, national, and global levels. We see that climate change is not only affecting um, only ourselves, but is it is going beyond the regional level. It is going beyond the national levels up to the global uh, up to the global level as a whole. And we we'll look at um, climate change and renewable energy. And renewable energy has always been the source that many climate activists. Have been have been advocating for. So we we'll also look at that. We we'll also look at climate change in relation to gender equality and women's empowerment. Then uh, we'll look at mitigation and adaptation plans. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, Bukram. Okay, so we shall begin with uh, an introduction to climate change. Uh, next slide. Okay, like, um, okay, let me just cancel this one. Okay, so we see that um, basically climate change is a topic that has been debated for years and it has come with so much challenges, it has presented so much uh, adversities. So we climate activists and other scientists and other scholars have been doing so much research in terms of climate change. And they have managed to come out with three constructive definitions. So we'll look at the first definition, what climate change is all about. So we have the first definition here that defines climate change. We have the definition that is written, it is the global phenomenon of climate transformation characterized by the changes in the usual climate of the planet, right? 
Then the second one states that it refers to the long term shifts in temperatures and weather pattern according to the UN, the United Nations. Then we have the third one, which is climate change. Other one, it refers to a change in climate over time, whether due to natural variability or as a result of human activity. But me, I for one, I would like to look at uh, the last definition. So it is being stated that it refers to a change in climate over time, whether to, due to natural variability or as a result of human activity. So today, I want to mostly look at both the natural variability and the human activity. But mostly, uh, we've seen that it's all about the human activity. We've seen the contribution of human activity up to a certain stage. So I want you to go to the next slide, please. And um, before you go, before you go to the next slide, I just want to explain the human activity. There are several human activities that have, affect, that have caused climate change. We can see the construction of fossil fuels. We can see the use of uh, the, 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 the most use, like um, the optimum use of uh, industry, of, of industry. The, the formulation of different chemicals, like, uh, can you please go to the next slide? So before I go, there are several uh, chemicals like hyperfluorocarbon that contribute to climate change. And with the, those fossil fuels like uh, the oil and the gas, and we also have somewhat uh, like petrol. This oil, the burning of such oil, contributes to the chemical reaction of uh, our planet, resulting in uh, intensity of uh, climate change. So before we look at that, we want to look at how and how we can act on climate and uh, what is climate justice. So there's this topic that I managed to navigate, which is the difference between climate justice and climate action. So as I say, there's several, several definitions that we can encounter uh, when dealing with climate change issues. And these key terms need to be understood carefully. They both play a pivotal role in climate change through the exhibition of their intellect roles and responsibilities. So this definition, the climate justice and the climate action, they are the key definitions that we walk through when dealing with climate change issues. So we go on to climate justice. So climate justice is all about it only focuses not only on the environmental aspects of climate change, but also on the social and ethical dimension. So this climate justice tends to look at how vulnerable communities, how marginalized communities suffer the intensity of climate change. So um, in terms of climate justice, we have heard that it does not only look at the environmental aspect, which might be... Um, the intensity of temperatures, but it looks at uh, the social and ethical dimension. It um, goes on to uh, to state that climate change uh, contributes to social issues. It also uh, jeopardizes ethics of us as humans. So, in that uh, in that regard, climate justice is all telling us about the fairness or the fair distribution of burdens and benefits that are related to climate change. Then we also go on to climate action, which, which us as advocates, us as activists, and us as people, we are tending to advocate for. This climate action is covering our advocacy. It is covering how we are acting on climate change. How are we acting early or are we acting late on climate change? So it refers to our efforts. It refers to the mitigation plans that we are coming up with. It refers to other adaptations plans that we are coming up with. So as we see, it is stated that it refers to the efforts and initiatives taken to mitigate 
and to adapt to the impacts of climate change. We all know that we all have been involved in um, grassroots initiatives, we've been involved in national initiatives, we've been involved in international initiatives. So this climate action, it's our efforts that we as activists, that we as um, advocates and other different people are playing. We are playing a key role. And these roles are the actions that we are putting it in to reduce the intensity of climate change. You can go uh, to the next slide. Okay, so as I said, today I was mostly focusing on how we humans negatively or how we adversely impact climate change. We as humans, we have unknowingly or unknowingly resulted in the impact, in the negative impact of um, climate change. Uh, for now, I just uh, have a certain, certain, um, like, um, uh, a certain topic that I, 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 I want you to vision. I want you to envision like um, a world where like uh, our planet, our planet uh, is a delicate balance of ecosystem, a costed sculpture by nature's forces. But now we the stewards of this earth, we are the architects of the different force, right? So this is a different statement that is going against us as humans. That is encouraging us as humans to act and to refuse uh, the negative impact of climate change that we are putting in. So can you uh, drive me to uh, the next slide so that I can go deeper? Okay, so like I find out, I've researched so many, so many um, uh, articles and most sources that I've researched and most documentations uh, in different sources have pointed us as humans as the sole contributors of climate change. And it shows that we humans have played like 75% of um, climate change. We have adversely contributed to climate change in various ways. Like I said, unknowingly or unknowingly. So we've contributed to climate change in various ways and I've laid out the outline below. Like I said, there is a burning of fuel of fossil fuels. The combustion of fuel fossil fuels um, such as coal, such as oil, such as natural gas for energy generation, transportation and industrial use. The most common greenhouse gas, gas and the primary contributor to the immense greenhouse effect. So this uh, point clearly states that we as humans have contributed and there is no other person who generates or who is involved in the use of fuels other than humans. We use fossil fuels in different ways. Of course, we use fossil fuels for heating, we use fossil fuels for cooking, we use fossil fuel um, for transportation. We also use fossil fuels for industrial use. So like this burning, this use, this like 100% use of these fuels have contributed to climate change through the generation of greenhouse gas effect. I think you've seen um, so many like uh, this, this one initiative that has been uh, trending in England that is called Just Stop Oil. This Just Stop Oil, they, it has been a real program that is um, bringing out the realism of climate change. And it is showing that we humans, we should stop. Instead, we should find alternative ways to eliminate burning fuels, which are causing greenhouse gas, gas effect, which this greenhouse, this greenhouse gas effect, which also is part and parcel of climate change. We also have deforestation, cleaning forests for agriculture, of course, forestry and urban expansion, diminishes the Earth's capacity to absorb carbon dioxide through photosynthesis. Trees operate as carbon sinks, absorbing 
carbon dioxide from the releases stored carbon on trees burn or die. So it seems that um, this um, deforestation, we all know that, before I go on to, to explain this point, we all know that um, trees are part of like um, the ecosystem, right? So these trees are a vital uh, aspect in um, shielding climate change. So we humans are rather impacting climate change by deforestating and by cutting down trees instead of planting more, right? So we cut down trees for different uses, like what we are saying here, we are cutting down trees for agricultural use. Of course, we say, a, give you an example, we want to farm, we want to do a certain certain project, maybe it might be horticulture, maybe it might be a cattle ranching, right so we are clearing down this these trees which are part of our life to uh sustain another life which is wrong we as activists we are encouraging the planting of more trees be it for farming or maybe for some use we are encouraging planting of more trees rather than cutting down for a specific use there is also another use like of forestry and urban expansion. Of course, the government, be it the government or the regions, they sit out and set out a plan to form maybe a settlement, be it a linear or a nuclear settlement at a certain, certain area. Of course, we can't set out our settlement where there are trees, right? That's what they look at. They can't set out, they need to create space for them to construct those nuclear settlements or those linear settlements. So um, in clearing off those trees, they are affecting themselves and us in regard, right? So what I'm trying to point out here is that you see that this evidence is pointing to us as humans that we've been cutting down trees for our use, for our own selfishness, which is an injustice to us as well, and also injustice to the global as a whole. Then um, we also have the third point, which is the land use changes. Changes in land use, in addition to deforestation, like I said before, can result in emission of greenhouse gases, draining wetlands or converting peatlands for agriculture. For example, can release enormous amounts of stored carbon as carbon dioxide and methane. This is one of um, the contributions as we see. Like I've already explained it, like I said, the construction of linear settlements, if you want to do cattle ranching, if you want to do maybe horticulture, we of course clear off the trees. But however, it is an injustice. So the, it, this is one in the same point uh, that is getting along. Then um, we also have, um, um, like um, I can't see the other one, yeah, the, the use of industrial chemicals. So hydro um, I can't see the other one that I just said. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Like uh, we, you've seen the use of refrigerants and industrial chemicals. So like, of course, in industries, they use different chemicals. They are involved in manipulation, maybe of some chemicals to form another, but this is contributing adversely to climate changes we see. Hydrofluorocarbons is one of the ones I stated it before we began. Perfluorocarbons are one of the, of the chemicals. Sulfur hexafluoroid SF6 is one of these, which are utilized in refrigeration, air conditioning, and industrial operations. So these are powerful greenhouse gases with considerable global warming potential. So as we see, we have seen that um, the construction or maybe uh, the manipulation of these chemicals in forming maybe something of good cause, like for maybe it might be refrigeration, maybe, maybe it might be for um, air conditioning, or maybe just maybe for industry operation. So we are saying that this generation of this chemical, it's, it's, it's adversely impacting to climate change as it is... Um, it is formulating greenhouse gases, which are considered to be one of the global warming potential. 
So it means that we have to find an alternative to or maybe a supplement to these refrigerants and industrial chemicals. We also have agricultural practices. I think I've stated this on deforestation in later stages, but I'll just go on to explain it. Land use, uh, like agriculture practices, agriculture practices like particular livestock husbandry emit considerable volumes of methane as a result of animal digestion and um, waste management. So nitrous oxide is also uh, is also are released when synthetic fertilizers are used in agriculture. So, of course, we um, we have certain certain plans to sustain ourselves. We also sustain ourselves um, through agriculture. We sustain our lives through um, farming sometimes. Yeah, but that was mostly done in traditional time. But right now, is in our times, yeah, it's still uh, one of the essentials. Agriculture is one of uh, the essential part of life. But still, it is one of the things that is contributing adversely to climate change. As we see that we've been the the, the rearing of different animals, be it um, cattle, be it hen, be it sheep, different types of livestock that we keep. It is said to be it is said and considered to be producing volumes of methane. A uh, be these volumes of ethane, methane before I go on is uh, maybe comes out and is generated through the animal digestion and waste management, right? So maybe we might um, like um, pile the waste to, uh, of livestock in different ways. Maybe they might use it for as fertilizers. But as we see that maybe this natural and um, like these synthetic fertilizers are also contributing to climate change. So they are, co they are, they, they are generating methane. They're also generating nutrient oxide which is one of um, the chemicals that are negatively impacting climate change and that are resulting in climate change. So as I, as I went through these points, I think you also that we as humans, we are playing a part in different ways. Of course, farming is not done by no one other than a human. Of course, the use or the construction or the production of chemicals is done nonetheless than humans. And deforestation is all also a human activity. Burning of fossil fuels, the construction or the use of um, fuels is being done uh, by us humans. So as we go through these points, I think we, I've clearly uh, stated out how we are obviously contributing to uh, climate change. You can go on to the next. I hope you understood. If you might have any questions, you are uh, willing to drop them at any time. You can go on to the next slide. Okay, so like we said previously, we said that we humans are a hand in climate change and like 75% of the times we've contributed to climate change. And this contributed this contribution to climate change has also come back to us in different ways. It has come back to us through humanitarian emergencies. And we all know, before we go on, uh, we all know um, what humanitarian emergency, emergencies are. And um, before I go on, I just maybe state out some emergencies that you might, um, I might, uh, you might want to understand. Number one will be tornadoes. Number one will be natural disasters. Number one will be number 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 three will be floods. Number four will be um maybe a cyclone or maybe a volcano, right? So before we go on, we have seen that this contribution, uh, this climate change is contributed to humanitarian humanitarian emergencies, and humanitarian emergencies are the disparation of people, are the vulnerabilities of people they have encountered through uh, maybe weather events and through maybe uh, natural disasters, right? So let's go on to uh, the next slide so that I can, um, you can gain a deeper understanding into it. So like um, we have seen the definition of humanitarian emergence. So I just want to read it out so that maybe you may understand 
humanitarian emergence are often referred to as humanitarian crisis or disasters. These are situations characterized by severe disruption in the normal functioning of a community or a society, leading to significant humanitarian needs that require agent and coordinated response, right? We all see and we enjoy um, the, the, the peacefulness of our society. We enjoy the normal living of our community without any distraction, with that we as humans leading our normal lives, going about our business. But as soon as humanitarian, as soon as these humanitarian images strike us, like maybe disasters or weather events strike us, we are deprived of our livelihoods. We are deprived of our normal living. So I want to go on through um, the humanitarian emergencies that I know of. The first one that I've stated out was the extreme weather effect. Climate change increases the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, typhoons, drought, floods, and heat waves. We also have food and water scarcity. Changes in temperature and precipitation pattern can negatively impact agricultural productivity, leading to food shortages and water scarcity. Number three, displacement and migration. Climate change induced disasters such as hurricanes and droughts can force people to leave their homes in search of safety and better living conditions. Then the third one is loss of livelihoods. Like climate change impacts sectors such as agriculture, fisheries, tourism, which are vital sources of income for many communities. So, like, I want to give an example. We is, um, I want you to just imagine maybe in a certain, certain community, you enjoy uh, your living, your normal living without any distraction. You go about your business, you go to work, you come back, you have food, you find time to go out, you find time to go maybe to tourist attracted places. Maybe sometimes you go to work, maybe sometimes you have life with your family. But when humanitarian emergencies strike us, we are deprived of all the social living that we have been um, doing all along. Number one, this will be food and water scarcity. We all survive in, on food and water. And food and water are part of our, our basic needs. So basically, we're being told that if temperature intensified at some point due to climate change, we are deprived of food and water is our basic needs. So we are we are deprived of in how, in what sense? Let me answer that. We are deprived when drought occurs. Drought is always a disaster also, right? If drought strikes our community, we no longer have access to food and water. And it's now different to navigate our agricultural practices. It becomes different. And as we see, food starts maybe to lessen for us. Maybe the, the, the amount of food that maybe we get from agricultural produces, it lessens. Because sometimes agriculture depends on weather as well. It depends on maybe much amount of rain, let's say in the production of rice day in India. If it becomes like... Um, if it comes to drought, we are unable to produce rice. We are unable to go about rice production. We are unable to go about planting rice or whatever, maybe nurturing those plants that maybe we might want to harvest or something like that, right? So we are affected. And rice is part of food, of course. Yeah, we've been surviving on rice. We've been surviving maybe here in Africa. We've been surviving on salsa. But when drought strikes us, we are deprived and we are no longer have we are no longer having that access to farm because of course we are affected we are affected as a community we are affected as individuals then when it comes to point number three which is displacement and migration displacement and migration it clearly states that we are moving from one place to another or maybe us as family members or maybe as a community, we've been displaced by a certain, certain disaster. 
I want you to give, I want to give you an example, uh, an example from me in Africa. In Africa, we had an example of Cyclone Idai. Cyclone Idai was one of the nine natural disasters that struck the Zimbabwean in the, in the Zambian community um, like three years ago in 2020. It left so many people, so many communities vulnerable and displaced. And some even died. So this disaster is um, considered to be a result of climate change. Right. So this interlinkage of climate change and humanitarian emergence can lead to displacement and migration. Of course, if we see that we have encountered disasters, we are somehow or unwillingly displaced by these disasters. And we are unable to have access to our livelihoods. Like I said, food and water, maybe to our houses, our houses are destroyed. Maybe access to transportation have been deprived. Access to health care have been deprived. Of course, things have been washed away. They say like cyclone, cyclone washed away everything that people were surviving on. We no longer have kettles. We no longer, we are no longer farming. We are no longer um, sustaining our livelihoods in, 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 in a normal way. We are all deprived of what we were supposed to have. Right? So climate change and humanitarian emergencies are interlinked and they can cause displacement and migration, leaving us vulnerable and desperate. Then we also have the last one that is the lives, the loss of livelihoods, like climate change impacts sectors such as agriculture, fisheries, and tourism, which are vital sources of income for many communities. As we see that um, I've talked of livelihoods, we all survive on different things, we all survive on agriculture as part of our livelihood. We all de de um, depend on fisheries as part of our livelihood. We also depend on tourism as part of our livelihood. Tourism is considered, firstly, before I go on to some uh, aspects like agriculture and fisheries, tourism is considered as a source of income in different ways. Because we see like um, if we have um, a certain, certain tourist attraction in our nation, or maybe at regional level, there are no there are so many tourists that come from different countries. There are also uh, some tourists that comes from within, so it's 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 regarded as source of income generations that also plays a vital role in our lives, right? And we also have agriculture, like I said previously, agriculture we farm, we do livestock keep like livestock rearing, we do um what do you call that? We do egg production. We do different sorts of things that are associated with agriculture, right? So imagine if a disaster strikes and this is the cause of climate change. This disaster has been impacted and caused by climate change. Imagine if this strikes and all of it is vanished, you see. So this means that we've lost our income generation. We've lost what we've been surviving on. So this is all about humanitarian emergencies. Secondly, humanitarian emergencies can lift so many people vulnerable. I didn't touch the aspect of disability, disabled people. Disabled people can be left vulnerable because they are no longer having um, access to maybe social services. They're no longer having access to health care. They are all deprived of what is basic to them. So humanitarian emergency can cause these things that I've listed down. Extreme weather event, food and water scarcity, displacement and migration, and loss of life blood, leaving us as humans um, vulnerable and desperate. Can I uh, move on to the next slide? Okay. So I think um, I've described um, climate change in maybe different different settings, but in terms of our next uh, concept, we want to look at how uh, climate change affects regional, national, and global levels. Because climate change does not only um, go on to limit certain certain places; it goes on to affect us globally. It goes on to affect us nationally. It goes on um, to affect regionally our inter our communities that we live in. 
So um, I will look at that and I will dive deeper into it into the next slide. Uh, so uh, regionally, uh, climate change disrupts ecosystem and intensifies extra extreme weather events. The nationally, it impacts food, water, food, and health. Internationally, it raises uh, sea levels and sparks tension. So basically, we want to first look at um, regional levels. Of course, like uh, like I said previously, we say that we, we as humans are sustained by um, tourism, we are sustained by agriculture, we are also sustained by different aspects that I've um, list, I haven't listed. It's part of our social services. So of course, climate change economically impacted us because we no longer have that sources of generation. We are no longer having that um, kind or that where we can maybe depend on because you're already depending on these aspects like tourism fisheries agriculture but when like climate change uh, disrupts or maybe okay in different it might be in extreme weather events it might be um intensified temperatures of course you are deprived and we are no longer having access and it's economically impacting us and economically affecting children because of course it's impacting children because like one children are no longer able to go to school they can't go to school on an empty stomach or maybe they can't go to uh they can't go to school at all because like the school has been destroyed by maybe a cyclone they die they're no longer having access to education they're no longer having access to health so it seems like it economically impact us and you're no longer having access to basic needs as i said previously and then um we have ecosystem. Um, as I said, ecosystem, uh, it's like a community of interlinked species and um, of different kinds. Right? It might be plants, it might be animals. So like, uh, of course, our ecosystem is disrupted. When it comes to climate change coming out, a, maybe in disaster form, I'm mainly looking at uh, a disaster form, it was like, we've seen climate change um, occurring uh, in disaster form, right? So, of course, our ecosystems are affected. We're like, we plant trees, of, of course, with our animals that we've been keeping, we've been raiding animals, we've been keeping, um, uh, like, different, different animals as part of um, our um, livelihood, or maybe as part of, uh, as a source of, 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 of what, Right. We also have uh, like animals, the one that we would like um, wild animal, the one that I that uh, maybe kept in it reserves, it came parks, or maybe they are there in the forest. They are also affected. So we maximize, we prioritize ecosystems as part of our livelihood. Ecosystem is part of past and is essential in sustaining our livelihood. So if it's affected at regional level, it may be in a community, certain, certain community like. Um, Mutari in Zimbabwe has been affected by cyclone die. Right? It has affected the whole community. It has affected the reserves that animals are living in. It has affected uh, the livestock. All things have been destroyed and were desperate. You see, so climate change coming in natural disasters can affect our ecosystem. Like I say, it can destroy everything that we have been investing on including those animals, including those ecosystems, because we all depend on ecosystem as our source. Then um, we have water resources. Like in terms of water resources, we all have been having like dams, and dams have been, dams have been playing a crucial role in the generation of electricity. Like here in Africa, we have uh, one of uh, the largest dams that uh, is most considered to be a generator of electricity, the Kariba deal, right? But if those water sources comes to be distracted in some sort of way, maybe by humanitarian emergencies, maybe like by um, one of the humanitarian emergencies would be maybe a typhoon, a tornado, or maybe um, an earthquake, you see. So like 
I'm just stating out, telling you how water resources can be. Of course, if a disaster comes in such an intensifying manner at the last level, it can destroy the dam. And there's no longer like this effect to our water resources. We're no longer able to get access to water. Of course, this dam has been doing water generation. It has been doing electrical generation. And we are no longer going uh, to access that. So this is how climate change is impacting people at regional levels. Because communities depend on dams like Kariba. They depend on that water for their um, for their normal living. So if that disaster comes to strike, or maybe if climate change comes to distract that dam in weather events or in some sort of a disaster, everything is deprived at the community level. And we are no longer able to get access to water resources. We are no longer getting access to that heating. Then I'm now going on to national level where we've seen economical losses and food security, migration and displacement, and infrastructure vulnerability. Of course, this is part of the nation economy, it's part of us, it's part of how we live. Food is one of our basic things, right? So with migration also, we've been like um, settled in our country. So we've been citizens of a certain city countries, we are settled and we do not have any disturbance. We are living in peace in our own countries. We have infrastructure where we've been running our day-to-day -day business, where we have maybe been doing industrial some um, processes, we've been doing uh, maybe whatever that we do in infrastructure, whatever that we use infrastructures for. Like we use them for our day-to-day -day business. Like I said, it might be maybe for shopping. It might be maybe for uh, our work. It might be maybe the industries also. So like, I want to look, look at economic losses. We've already lost the economy when it comes to um, climate change. If climate change comes to affect a nation as a whole, it's sort of like um, something that is intense and that can affect the whole system economically. Like the finances, we've been generating finances from uh, revenues, from taxes, from whatever that we've been doing, like we as taxpayers have been paying taxes to the government, right? But when it comes to, if climate change comes to affect us in different ways, like I previously said, maybe it might be humanitarian emergencies. If it comes to affect that, it has also affected our economy. Secondly, it has affected our economy because like the economy has to give out to find or maybe to seek um, maybe finances to control or maybe to find initiatives that maybe would sustain uh, or maybe would prevent uh, the climate, to prevent climate change from negatively impacting uh, the nation, you see. So it has to involve like maybe the government has to pay out some funds, they have to seek maybe alternatives to maybe conduct or maybe to mitigate climate change, you see. We also have food security. Like I said, the thing about food security is also ringing and ringing and ringing. We've been sustaining ourselves on agriculture, of course, in different ways. Everything, the food that we eat, they go to the industries, it's raw materials, they're processed, they are outputs that are sold out in shops, right? It's part of the food. It's part of something that is sustaining the economy. It's part of, it's part of something that is sustained the citizens of a certain city nation like South Africa. But when it comes to humanitarian emergencies, it also affects the agricultural aspect. Uh, the agricultural aspect which produces food for the nation, which offers like 99%. So we see that we as a nation suffer loss. We suffer food insecurities. We are unable to offer to the communities, of course because we've been depending on agriculture yes like i said it has been done traditionally but still today agriculture lives on and it has been sustaining all of us then we also have migration and displacement displacement migration and displacement is one of um the things that uh, climate change has contributed at its national level 
of course if climate change struck we are all now looking for maybe greener pastures we are not now looking for a better place to stay right so basically there's some displacement that was done we are all known for living um in a certain certain community we are united as a nation we are united as citizens but when climate change comes to strike it's we are unable we are unable to live in harmony we are unable to live in unity we are displaced and migration we are migrating to different countries sometimes we might tend to be refugees or maybe asylum seekers which is also something that is more of a challenge right then infrastructure vulnerability we're always been depending uh on infrastructure as part of our day-to-day living we've been running uh industrial processes we've been going to work we've been going to schools we've been accessing health care health services we've been going about our business under infrastructures through infrastructures right we are using buildings we are using uh buildings as part of our shopping malls we are using buildings as part of our clinics and hospitals we are using buildings as part of our schools so this affect is humans it affects us because if it comes in a humanitarian emergency context of course you are left vulnerable buildings are distracted schools are destroyed we're no longer having access to health is hospitals are destroyed all the access maybe to basic needs like the medicines and what what we are no longer able to get them because we were able to get them through uh the hospitals through clinics but if they are destroyed where can we get them then we take a look at inter- international level we have um disparities of course uh, at international levels we've seen like the united nations they've been coming about um uh, with uh different initiatives to to tackle climate change but they've since been reporting disparities disparities a certain certain level so this international this international um level it tends to look and it tends to help also to aid to regional and national levels right so internationally there are disparities because they've been like We've been advocating for something like climate change. And we've suffered disparations, vulnerabilities. People are not moving, they're migrating, and they're seeking for maybe greener pastures. Of course, this causes disparities. And it also tends to cause conflicts, like we said, because it intensifies maybe like uh, tensions between nations. People, most citizens are going to another country, of which another country is also depending on another country. You see, so it's impossible for countries to go along in such a way. It might be they are going against some policies. It might be they are going against some initiatives. You see, like they just stop oil. It is caused conflicts amongst countries. Some are supportive, some are not in support of just stop. Oil. So these are part of. It. So, yeah. We can move to the next slide. Okay, so like um, this is the topic that I also find uh, is essential with climate change and renewable energy. And all of us like uh, in our initiatives, we've been involving renewable energy as part of our initiatives, right? So. In this topic, we are going to look at how renewable energy can be an alternative of um, the of maybe fossil fuels. Number one, of um, these uh, non-renewable energies that have been causing climate change, like these non-renewable energies like coal, oil, and gas. Right. So as we delve into maybe renewable energy, we are going to see that um they've been contributing this or maybe they've not been contributing to climate change can you go on to the next page so that i can maybe explain further so the impacts of climate change um very widely affecting regions and nation like we said but renewable energy 
it's been suggested it's regional, national, and global level, right? I want you to picture a world powered by sunlight, wind that never tire, and rivers that never dry. This is not science fiction. It's clean energy and revolution. That is within our grasp, right? So one of the solutions that we can use to cl combat climate change is renewable energy. It plays a crucial role in administering sustainable development and for, in, in fostering a sustainable future. Climate change drives agency for sustainable energy sources. Renewable energy like solar and wind mitigates greenhouse gas emissions, reducing the environmental impact. Transitioning to renewable energies, uh, transitioning to in, in renewable energies, release resilience, keeps pollution and fostering the future. So, like we've seen that um, this non-renewable energy is causing causing like pollution is so air pollution in different ways, which is part and parcel of climate change, right? So, by fostering and by implementing renewable energy sources like coal, like uh, sorry, like solar and wind, the use of solar panels, we all like in terms of load shedding, we all depend on solar, like um. In terms of like maybe generating electricity or maybe for industrial use or maybe for 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 household use wind is part in pass is part in parcel so we also have water like i said hydro it's part of uh non-renewable energy it keeps on it goes on and on and on it's part of renewable energy sorry it goes on it can be renewed and renewed but non-renewable energy that we cannot renew that we just use maybe Permanently, it, it just goes on like that without we maybe being uh, used once or twice, right? So what I'm trying to bring out is that renewable energy plays a crucial role in mitigating and um, combusting climate change, because of course we now have something that is natural, something that we can all depend on, something that doesn't that doesn't affect or that doesn't emit greenhouse gases. Right. So I think uh, in terms of renewable energy, I've tried uh, to bring out some sort of point. So yeah, this renewable energy fosters resiliency and it's much lesser impacting in terms of climate change. It rather fosters a greener future whereby we do not use oil, we rather use something like solar, something like hydroelectricity is part of our level. You can go on to the next. So yes, um, I think we've reached to the end of um, this uh, topic, the mitigation and adaptation plans of climate change. There are so many plans that have been laid out by the United Nations, by um, grassroots, by maybe uh, by maybe nations, by uh, maybe regional communities, right? So we are going to look at how we can mitigate and how can we, we can formulate plan to tackle climate change. So this mitigation and adaptation plans for climate change can play a crucial role in advancing um, sustainable future and fostering a greener future at regional national, grassroots, or international levels. So we shall delve deeper into mitigation and adaptation plans for climate change. Then, um, yeah, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, there are several mitigation and adaptation plans that have been adapted by several regional, national, and international institutions, including individuals and community. There is the use of renewable energy, like, like we said previously, the use of solar, wind, and uh, what do you call that? Um, uh, hydroelectricity, right? So the increasing use of renewable energies such as solar, wind, hydro, and geothermal power to replace fossil fuels for electric generation. So I think it's part of mitigation plan because as we said, we said that it fosters resilience, it rather um, encourages and drives greater future so like um this use of renewable energy can be an alternative to what we've been using to to to, to learn renewable sources that we've all been depending on like oil and somewhat maybe um 
fossil fuel, right? So this can be a mitigation plan. We can mitigate and we can foster a greener future rather than continuing generating or maybe using um, fossil fuels as part of our, as part of our household use or as part of industry use. Then there's energy efficiency, implementing measures to reduce energy consumption in buildings, transportation, and industrial processes through better technologies, practices, and standards. In terms of energy efficiency, we all have seen that um, many people have been advocating for like the use of electric uh, cars, right? I think it's one of the things that, uh, that, 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 that have been suggested in like Western countries like the UK. They've been suggesting the use of electric cars rather than the one that, um, that uses fuel. Right. So through the use and through the invention of technologies, through uh, the use of maybe the construction of some policies or maybe uh, maybe practices standards, we have seen uh, the store and consumption of energy, right? It may be building, transportation and industrial processes, which is part of our medic which is part of mitigation planning. Then we also have afforestation and reforestation. Um, like um, I said previously, we've talked of deforestation and we say that it, it, it is one of um, the result of climate change because we humans have been having a hand in cutting down trees for different uses. So afforestation and deforestation can be also a mitigation plan because planting trees and restoring forests as they are, just planting more trees, as we said, um, plant trees are part of our ecosystem they are in, they are also issued to climate change. So planting more trees and destroying forests to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and enhance carbon sinks can be a mitigation plan, right? Because of course the ecosystem is part and parcel of um, our society and our livelihood. This means that uh, it has been sustaining us and it has been shielding us from climate change in different ways. Then we also have post management. We talked of um, uh, uh, waste management in farming settings where we say that animal um like um animal waste produces this um this chemical that contributes uh to maybe um the emission of greenhouse gases right so waste management um improving waste managing how we store how we store waste be it animal waste reduces the methane emissions from landfills and promoting recycling and composting this is part of a mitigation plan, as we see, because we saw that animal waste is part of, um, it produces that part of chemical that contributes to climate change. So by managing waste in a way that is maybe, um, uh, maybe let's say um, in, 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 by recycling or maybe, by recycling is, we can um, combat climate change and we can rather tackle it and reduces that chemical that is being brought out by several animals that is causing a greenhouse effect. This greenhouse effect, which is also impacting climate change. Then we also have um, infrastructure resilience as part of our adaptation plans. Uh, designing and upgrading uh, infrastructures. We've seen that, uh, that this modern age, uh, like I think in Dubai, um, they've been advancing their uh, infrastructure. And we saw the, um, this infrastructure, it has been strengthened to be an arm to climate change. So that maybe if climate change comes in a result of maybe a disaster or something, they're fully equipped to tackle. So they can adapt, they can like, they're not able maybe to, to suffer vulnerabilities or risks of climate change. They rather adapt than to suffer. Then we also have ecosystem protection. We said ecosystem is one of um, the shields of climate change. And by preserving and restoring a natural ecosystem like woodlands, mangroves, and coral reefs, we provide valuable services such as storm protection, and water regulation. So ecosystem is a shield, like we said, it consists of interconnected plant and animal 
right, of different species. So it has been our um, part and parcel, and it has been a shield, right? So by protecting the ecosystem, by, prevail, by, by preserving and restoring natural ecosystems, it provides maybe a valuable services such as storm protection and rather water regulation. Then we also have engagement, which truly encourages activists, the community engagement, holding on together, coming up with policies, coming up with sustainable practices to combat climate change. So by engaging local communities, different stakeholders from different maybe um, parts of the nation, this communica community engagement, this unity, this collaboration can actually make and come out and construct sustainable practices, policies, and um, maybe some outlines that do not um, impact climate change, but ra that rather focuses on um, promoting sustainable future. So I think I've talked uh, quite a lot and yeah, thank you so much. This is the end of our session and I, I, I hope I didn't go too long. I mean, yeah, thank you. Yes, Kanti, how are you? Now, thank you so much for the insightful thing. It was really helpful. And uh, I think it will help a lot to yeah. people, right? And uh, we'll be sharing this on YouTube also so that whenever people want to refer, they can do that. But it was really a great session. I think we learned a lot. Um, so how was your experience like, you know? Um, being with soul and uh, how do you want to like we would really want to have such sessions in future as well um, so thank you so much or would you like to end with some few words mm, the only few words that i can end with is to just advise maybe more of collaboration and more of constructive policies because like uh, the reason why we are not uh, tackling climate change or the reason why we are not able to mitigate or to formulate uh, constructive plans that we are not holding mm -hmm. on together we are not collaborating we are rather leaving it we are rather like ignoring the situation while while mm -hmm. it is intensifying day by day so i encourage people to combat and to like uh, collaborate and engage more in uh, fostering inclusivity and also holding on together in constructing policies and standards that combat climate change and that type of climate change rather than intensifying climate mm. change. Okay. Yeah, sure. I think that would be great. Like, or I think that's also very important, right? So maybe in future we can collaborate on something like that and, uh, you know, we can see that how we can go about it, how soul, uh, we as a soul team, you know, can help and uh, expand the knowledge regarding this. And what are the things that we can do from our end then to, you know, um, help the society or to engage the society more into this conversation and educate them more on this. So I think, Easy. yeah, uh, we'll be in contact for sure. And so thank you so much for such a, a nice session. And uh, welcome. Have a, a nice day ahead. See you next time. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, okay, for joining. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Okay, sure.